Okay, looks like we're all set up. I had to do a few technical adjustments. Um, sorry, sorry for you that do not have sound. Um, even though this um, tool will work on mobile devices, uh, sometimes there's a big issue with those. So I'm hoping you're on a regular computer. Like I said, sometimes the mobile devices don't work properly, like uh, tablets and phones. So anyway, we have a large class today. We have about 89 people that were registered. I don't know how many are online because I'm not going to try to count it. But uh, we have a large class. And uh, again, we're going to talk about lockout tagout today. And uh, we'll go through a, a few logistics before we get started, our normal ones. Uh, we're going to be online for at least or, or as much as an hour and a half. So one and a half hours is how long we're scheduled for. And um, so uh, it may not take that long, but either way, you're going to get one and a half hours credit for this webinar, regardless of how long we actually take. And that depends on the questions and comments and conversations that we have uh, that determines our length. So we'll probably be on here at least an hour, uh, you know, maybe even an hour and a half. Um, so uh, today's webinar, um, you're going to get that credit, hour and a half credit, which you can use for certifications such as MeSH. So if you're maintaining certifications, uh, within about three weeks, uh, you'll receive your training certificate for this class. And of course, that's only if you're online 80% of the time and that you're registered for the class. So if you're on, on your computer and registered and you have people sitting around you, only you will be the one receiving credit. Okay, so um, let's see a little bit about myself. A lot of you already know me. I've been with the Department of Labor about five years. Prior to DOL, I worked 28 years in various safety training and quality management positions in the textile machine assembly and pharmaceutical industries. Most of those years were in pharmaceuticals which I am now retired. So um, I was in manufacturing for quite a few years running a safety program. So again, I know what you're running a safety program. So again, I know what you're going through. And um, logistics for this class, uh, look around your work area and try to limit any distractions. If you have an office, you might want to close your door, turn your phones off. If you're in a cubicle, it would be good for you to use headphones and put up a do not disturb note. Again, today we're using Webinado. A lot of you are on all our webinars. You know about it. But for you new folks, in the center of the screen, you'll see the PowerPoint slides, and I'll advance those throughout the class. At the bottom left corner, you'll see an emoji. I will not be using that uh, today because there's so many people in class, uh, I can't even see all the names at once. I have to scroll down so that emoji we're not going to use. It's, it's kind of cool, but we're not going to use the emoji. But you will be using the chat box. If you don't see it, scroll down to the bottom of the screen, and I'll be asking questions. We'll take questions at the session end, and I'll be looking at, at the chat as we go through the session. Uh, uh, you must attend 80% of the course to receive credit, and I'll check the, the times after we're through. And again, we can't give credit to anyone who's not registered and logged in. And uh, you should get your certificate within three weeks. If you don't, give us a call. So now, uh, since we've gotten through all the boring uh, announcements, uh, we can go ahead and get into our topic. Now, one thing I like to do in my webinars, I like to do some instant polls. And uh, this first poll question is, um, experience level. So in regard to lockout tagout, what is your experience level with this topic? And uh, we're going to share the results and we're going to start the poll. It's always good for us to know the experience level of our class. And for those of you that are advanced or intermediate, um, please be patient with us because the beginners may not know that much about lockout tagout. And the intermediate and advanced people may know a lot about it. And hopefully everybody will learn something today. If you don't learn anything today, then great. You can say, I'm really on top of lockout, tagout. But like I said, you may 
learn a couple of things today. And there's some things that I know that safety professionals are confused on. And I want to make sure that you're not confused on some of these things uh, that we're going to talk about today. So it looks like uh, most of our people are intermediate and uh, 16, 28 intermediate, 16 beginners, and five advanced. And we had 89 registered, so we may have some people uh, checking in or logging in here in just a few minutes. So let's go ahead and stop that poll and um, close it. And I'm going to go to another instant poll. And uh, this one is uh, professional safety experience. And this is also interesting to me. How many years of professional safety experience do you have? So again, uh, this also gives you an idea who all your classmates are as far as a safety experience. Now, one thing we don't do, we keep the list of uh, attendees private because, um, again, that's something that we're asked to do. Uh, but uh, I'm looking at the whole list, and I can see the uh, diversity, diversity of safety experience that you have in the class. So we have a few beginners. Uh, most of you are in the one to five year range, six and the five to 10, and we have some super duper veterans in the greater than 10 years. So um, a, good, a good spread of experience there uh, in safety. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop that poll and close it. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you a question. Uh, but first, uh, we got a we got a comment. Let me look at our comments here. Sound is in and out. Okay. Uh, is anybody getting good sound? Anybody getting good sound? We're doing a ch sound check. Okay. All right. Good sound. All right. Um, we had another comment. Sound but no slides. All right. Um, if you have sound and no slides, uh, Ricky, um, I'm looking at your comment there. Are you on a computer or a mobile device? And you can go ahead and type your answer in there. We'll go ahead and see what your issue might be. A computer or a mobile device. And I'm getting a lot of. A lot of uh, comments here. I don't have a response back from uh, Ricky, but uh, let me see. Uh, let me look at my list. Okay. Uh, Ricky, Ricky and Stephanie, I see that both of y'all are on a mobile device. Uh, some mobile devices have uh, trouble with the slides. So I would suggest that you um, uh, Get out of that mobile device, log out, and log back into the class on a regular computer if you can. Or if you want to just listen to the webinar the whole time, you can. You just won't have any visuals. But uh, some of those mobile devices definitely have an issue. Um, and I've got, uh, I'm looking at Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie has a mobile device too. So, Stephanie, I don't know if you're having any problems seeing the slides or not. So Ricky, uh, looks like you're typing a comment. Okay, well, anyway, just to let you know, if you're on a mobile device, you may have issues. If you are, go ahead and go to your nearest computer and go, go to the webinar using the con a regular uh, computer. All right, now let's go ahead and get going with the webinar. and. Um, Ask you, I'm going to go ahead and ask you a question. <clears throat> Today we're talking about lockout, tagout. And in lockout, tagout, there are three groups of employees that have to be, have to be trained. Three groups of employees that have to be trained. Can you name those groups? Oh, Tyler, you're right on top of it. Tyler, you're correct. Authorized affected and other 
great, Dan, thanks for the answer too. Um, this is where there's a lot of confusion and uh, this is where companies probably aren't training enough people. And we're gonna try to do a very good job explaining the difference there and several 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 of you have uh, of course typed that in and thank you for that response I've, some of you are really on top of it today I like that all right so today we're going to talk about control of hazardous energy are we just talking about electrical energy are we just talking about electrical uh, what about it no that's correct and we've got lots of no's there. Uh, there's a lot more to it than electrical. Um, now let me ask you, since we're talking about electrical for a second, how many of you have ever been shocked by electricity? Shocked by electricity. How many of you ever been shocked? Okay, I have too. Uh, when I was a kid, I, uh, they didn't have those little outlet co plug-in covers and I stuck something in my finger or something. I remember sticking something in the outlet and I got that shock. Now, um, now of course, obviously it didn't kill me because I'm here today, but because I wasn't standing in water and it didn't go across my heart, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't die. And a lot of people don't respect 120 volts. Uh, there's plenty of amps in one of those outlets to kill you. And, um, so uh, 100 milliamps will, could stop your heart. So you just tell people, tell your employees in their training that uh, you have to respect uh, 120 volt uh, outlets just like you need the high voltage uh, equipment. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So today we're gonna talk about procedures, methods, responsibilities for the employer. Uh, what do the employees need to be trained on and what are the inspection requirements? And we know that this topic, most of us know already, that this is for the control of hazardous energy, which can seriously hurt us or kill us. So anything that can kill you at work, uh, we probably need to be training on and putting in safeguards for. Now, we've got a picture on this slide of a lockout station and this was taken by a compliance officer. Could there be any red flags? If all you're seeing is this picture of a lockout station, could there be issues there? What do you think? Now, if you want to enlarge the slides, there's a, a large, enlarge box on your screen. You can go full screen. But to, to chat and make comments, you'll have to minimize it. But... Um, if you just saw that lockout station, um, you think ad you think adequate controls are in place for the use of those devices? It doesn't appear to be. And so if you have a lockout station hanging up here, there's no controls, there are no procedures for the issuance of those devices, uh, that would not be good. And sometimes you'll see a, a lockout station and you'll see um, two keys hanging out of a lockout lock. Uh, two keys, seeing two keys on a lock like that would be against a red flag. And our compliance officers would be asking lots of questions if they saw a lockout station like this. They would be asking, how do you maintain control, control over uh, those devices going in and out of this lockout station. Okay, and good comment, Keith. Uh, not complete in a general use lock at upper right. Good response. So if I got a lockout station that's very controlled, I'm not going to be hanging any other types of locks up there. It's not a storage place for all locks. That's a great answer. Now. Today, uh, lockout tagout, we're talking about people that service and maintain machines or equipment where they could start up or release stored energy, which can cause serious injury. So, so a serious injury would be anything beyond first aid. And that's when they install, set up the equipment, adjust, maintain it, inspect it, modify, or do routine service to the equipment. So if you're in a company or an organization, um, 
what department what department of a company typically locks and tags out equipment? What department? In your organization. Okay, mechanics, maintenance, there you go. Facilities management, maintenance, those types of folks. Now, um, could you have a program where people other than maintenance were issued locks? You just answered my question, Dale. Operators. And David, yes. So um, the OSHA standard talks about the people that service and maintain the equipment. They may be an equipment operator that's qualified to service their own equipment. So you could have maintenance, you could have operators and other people that perform that work. Who performs the service and maintenance work? Uh, that would be your authorized employees. So it could be several different departments or job titles. Now, uh, this slide says it does not con cover construction, agriculture, maritime, electric transmission distribution, uh, oil and gas drilling servicing. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't have lockout, tagout. What that means is there are other standards, other OSHA standards that cover them. Now, this standard is for general industry. So if you're in construction, you're going to have similar procedures, but construction is a little bit different, and these others are also a bit different as well. So uh, somebody's covered under the standard. If they are required to remove a guard or bypass a safety device and place their part of their body into the point of operation, that's where the machine does the cutting, bending, the work, where you could get, may say, an amputation if you stuck your finger in there, or you could get burned or crushed, the point of operation. Now, there's also, when you think about lockout, tagout, you're also thinking about power transmission. If you think about the old days when you had uh, rivers, and you had water wheels, and you had mills that run from that water wheel. When that water wheel turn was turned by the water, if you go inside the facility, you had gears, gears and belts and pulleys um, that turned where people could get caught in or could get hurt if they put their body in certain places where you had those moving parts. Uh, it might not be the point of uh, operation, but if it's power transmission and you got moving parts, people can get hurt there too. So you may be locking out the transmission of power or the point of operation on a piece of equipment. Now, there is an exception in the standard. Like the slide says, minor tool changes and adjustments and minor surface is done during the operation. This like Let's say um, you work on a production line, and every 20 minutes you have to oil, oil the equipment. You have to lubricate the equipment. And let's say the equipment does not uh, allow you to lubricate it without opening, uh, remove, uh, opening a door. Uh, now, the modern equipment, when you open the door, uh, if it's modern and you opened a door that, that exposed the point of operation, what would that door have on it? What would that door be equipped with? An interlock. That's right, Carol. Uh, an interlock. So if every 20 minutes you got to do some oiling, you open the door, it's interlocked, the machine stops, you oil, you close the door, and you keep going with the equipment. So uh, again, that is an interlock. Uh, and one thing I also want to tell you, if you have equipment out there, like you say, let's say you have a piece of large equipment and it has a metal base to it, it's mechanical. And uh, there's a door in that metal base that if you open that door, there are like gears turning and pulleys and all that. Uh, one thing that's required is uh, that equipment should have uh, designed in it a requirement to use a tool 
to get into that door. Uh, it may be screwed down. You might have to like go grab a tool. You have to grab something special to be able to open that door. Uh, if you have a, a machine that has moving parts in it and it has a, a simple door that just snaps open, that would not be proper design. So somebody could just snap that door open, it's running, put their hand in there and get hurt. So uh, modern equipment, you may not have ever thought about it. You say, well, gosh, you know, why, is this, why do they have this where I have to go get a tool to open this door? Because there's moving parts in there. So, um, and let's say the door's not interlocked. Uh, you'd have to have some protection designed into that equipment. Now, again, it doesn't cover normal production. But anything you do in normal, normal production, you have to have safeties built in so that you're not putting employees at risk. Now, um, we've got a picture of a drill here. If somebody was going to work on this particular drill um, and they had that cord under their control, um, they don't have to lock out that plug. So that plug, if I'm working on that drill and I've got that plug right there, um, anybody, that, nobody's going to come up here to me and try to work on that drill while I'm working on it. I'd say, look, I'm working on this drill. Don't mess with it. I've got the plug with me. It's in my control. So nobody plugs it in while I'm working on it. Now, this is really an interesting picture. Um, uh, this is another thing you may learn today. Um, what um, what type of drill? I mean, besides being electric and besides it being plugged in, you know, to use. What type? What type of drill is this? It's got two prong plug on it. Two two prong. Okay, Mike is insulated. William is double insulated. So. Um, Anybody that would work on this drill, uh, it has to be the manufacturer or a authorized service center for the uh, equipment. Even though your, your maintenance person could break that case open, they have violated the uh, double insulation for that drill, and they are not authorized to work on that drill, even though they could fix it. That double insulated insulation is not certified anymore when that case is put back together. And Rick, you're right. There's a symbol on there that shows double insulated. <clears throat> so one thing you'll learn today, if you've got double insulated tools, um, you can't break that case open and work on it unless you're authorized. Now, um, now let's say you want to replace the plug of that drill. If you did anything like that, it had to be to the same condition or uh, same protected condition as it was when it was manufactured. And in this case, it's probably all one piece and you, pr you probably wouldn't want to do that either. Other equipment, uh, if you're replacing plugs, it has to meet the same rating and uh, characteristics of the original. But like I said, this is double insulated. It's a special case. Now, uh, on that slide, you also see hot tap operations. That is transmission and distribution for gas, steam, water, or petroleum, uh, where they're performed on pressurized pri pipelines, where continuity of service is essential and shutdowns is impractical. So if you have natural gas electric distribution systems, sometimes it's not practical to shut it down. So that's what hot tap is, and so that's out of scope for this standard. And there's safety procedures for that, but not covered by this standard. Now, um, right now, uh, do, do y'all have any questions or comments, or are you good to go? We're going to stop here for a second and see if everybody's okay. Okay, Dale's good, Carol, Denise, Mike. Okay, everybody's good to go. All right, so our first bucket of employees are authorized. <clears throat> These are the people that are working on the equipment that if they did not use lock and or tag, they would be at, uh, they, they would be at risk. 
And, um, and I'll get to your question, Ricky, in a second. So uh, they're the people working on the equipment have to lock and tag it out for their own protection. That's your authorized employees. Like you said, that could be your maintenance folks. It could be operators. It could be others, as long as they're qualified to work on their own equipment. Now, Ricky said, would that work? Uh, you were talking about uh, live electrical um, with some, some companies' operations that would require a permit. Uh, now, working on live electrical, uh, you start getting in the NFPA 70E. You start getting in the other lot of uh, standards and procedures. Uh, so there's a lot involved if you're working on live electrical. So today, we're not talking about working on live anything. This is de-energized de equipment. Now, affected employees, uh, these are the employees that operate the equipment, but they don't work on it. So when I was in pharmaceuticals and we were packaging product and, and folks were working on the packaging line, uh, they may be working on the, the uh, tablet filler that puts tablets in the bottles, and that machine needs to be worked on. They're not uh, qualified to work on their own equipment. They call maintenance. Maintenance comes in and uh, maintenance does their thing. So they need to know what's going on when maintenance comes in and locks out or tags their equipment out. So those are the affected employees. They use equipment that's worked on by somebody else. Affected. Mainly in a, in a factory, that's like your production operations. And um, so that's affected. So we have other. I mean, and other is the other bucket. So you have authorized, affected, and other. Uh, again, when I was in pharmaceutical manufacturing, uh, we trained all employees on lockout tagout. The authorized employees had to know a lot. All employees on lockout tagout. The authorized employees had to know a lot more than the affected employees, and the affected employees had to know more than the other employees. Now, the other employees would be, let's say you have a factory and you have a plant manager or accounting manager, or controller, secretary, administrative folks, HR, those folks, if they ever walk through areas where equipment is locked and tagged out, they need to be trained. Because especially if it's a tag out only, if they violated that tag, they could be putting somebody at risk. So in, in a company, nobody has an excuse for not knowing about lockout tag out. Now, what would happen is in some companies, uh, they, some companies, all they do is train the authorized employees. Other companies train authorized and affected, but not the other. I'm saying you need to train them all. But to save time and money, a lot of people will not train the other employees. And the, another good reason to train those other employees is these people go home and they do things at home and we don't want them hurt there. And they start doing things like installing ceiling fans and doing different things. And these principles for safety apply to us at home, even though OSHA does not um, you know, cover homeowners, OSHA covers employees, but the concepts of lockout, tagout apply to everybody. The, the standard doesn't. Um, in the old days, um, if you had a tube television and um, uh, you did, uh, these flat panel TVs came out and you said, I'm getting rid of this tube TV, and you unplug it, um, these old tube TVs, if you had a child that liked to take things apart, uh, would there be any stored energy in that unplugged old tube TV unit? Would there be any stored energy in there? Yes, absolutely. Capacitors. So don't think at work or at home just because something's unplugged, that it's safe. And don't assume that just because the equipment is turned off, that it's safe. 
Uh, you may at home, you may replace an element on your oven. It's a pretty easy job. A, a, a bottom element on a, uh, an oven, a bake element. It's an easy job. You can go to a store and buy a bake element. Now, one th the shortcut would be to uh, not trip the breaker, you know, for the oven. But, but the other people would say, well, you know, I've got the oven turned off. What's the hazard? So what they do is they start in the wiring that oven element, and then they push that element back through the back of the oven. There's live electrical back there that can be contacted. And you can have you can have an electrocution, or you can fry essentially fry your your oven. You're not frying food; you're frying your oven. You're you're ruining it. You can have an you can have a an explosion fire. Those got kind of stuff from something something simple like changing an oven element. There's your home example. When you train people at work, especially those people that don't want to be there, try to give some home examples because I mean, if you're hurt or killed, that does affect you at work. It doesn't affect your OSHA log or your OSHA rates, but you lose an employee. So we want safety to be at home as well. Now, with the energy involved, with lockout, tagout, you see the list. Mechanical, something that turns or has um, gravity, potential energy there. Hydraulic. Um, can you give me an example of hydraulic? What is what equipment uses hydraulic energy? Can you give us some examples? A jack, forklift, an elevator, a pre okay, lift table. Okay, there those are good hydraulic examples. Uh, you could have chemicals. Now, one thing, and boy, you're really coming up with a list here. <laughs> A bobcat. I see that's with a capital B, so I guess that's not the animal, right? That's the uh, skid steer. Uh, yes, uh, a bobcat or any other skid steer or loader could have uh, hydraulic. Now um, let's let's move on. Let's move on to um, chemical. Now I'll give you an example. Uh, first of all, everything is made up of chemi chemicals and elements. So you might say kind of like everything's a chemical. Okay, Ashley says lines in a manufacturing plant. True. So you have these lines that are running through your plant, and they have different things running through them. What could you have in those lines that's dangerous? What, what could be going through those lines in a manufacturing plant? Gas formaldehyde, hydrogen sulfide, acid, uh, water. Could water be hazardous? There's another one when it, it depends, yes. Uh, steam, acetone, wow, lacquer. Like I said, if it's under pressure, or I'll give you a pharmaceutical example uh, we made our own pharmaceutical water that met USP standards, and that distribution system had to be maintained at 80 degrees C. That's extremely hot. People can get burned big time with 80 degrees C water. So y'all gave some great examples of chemical. All right, pneumatic. What is driving pneumatic equipment? What powers pneumatic equipment? Air. Right, compressed air. So air um, uh, is compressed and it drives this equipment. It could be uh, packaging assembly equipment. It could be like nail guns. Tammy says, okay, there you go. Um, all right. So that's pneumatic. Now electrical, I mean, we could go forever with electrical examples. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time with electrical. Thermal. What could, um, what generates thermal energy? Ovens, right. Hot press, furnace, water heater. Okay, 
those are some great examples. Torch. Now, of this list, which ones could have stored energy? Stored energy. Like you turn it off, you still got energy there. Okay. Some of you are saying all. Okay, that's a good answer. But um, pneumatic, uh, the, some of the best examples are pneumatic and uh, electrical. Now, um, some of you have already named what in electrical could have stored energy. What was that that stored that energy? You've already named it in the chat. Capacitors, that's correct. So uh, anyway, um, capacitors, again, uh, store energy. That, that's a hazard, stored energy. Now, uh, there are capacitors on lots of different pieces of equipment in a, with a company. Uh, a good simple example is giant electrical motors. You have these giant electrical motors. When you turn those on, you have, it needs more energy to get it going than to keep it going. So these giant motors, um, the capacitor helps get it going. So it's nice and smooth. Now, if you had a giant motor without a capacitor on there, when it started up, what would you notice in your facility when that motor starting up? Okay, what 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 would you know? What might you notice? A power draw, like <laughs> lights them. You could would hear it. So you're at work, all of a sudden the lights dim. You're going, oh, yeah, there's the big motor starting up again. Well, you know, um, that's really not a good design. And the people that make no motors know that. And, um, of course, Joel, you mentioned the noise, too. And the noise is energy also. Gravity. Yeah. Yeah, gravity. Uh, gravity, um, I'm going to lump that with mechanical, but gravity is something. So uh, there's potential energy there if something's elevated, uh, like fork trucks with the forks elevated with a load on it or not a load on it. An elevator is is not at the very bottom. There's potential uh, potential uh, energy there. Uh, so uh, gravity is part of the mechanical. So uh, the gravity is a good answer, um, but it, like like Ricky said, it's lumped with your mechanical there. Now, if if you have the need for lockout tagout in your operations, you shall have an energy control program. So if OSHA ever calls on you to do a compliance inspection. Or if your insurance company comes over to, to inspect you, or if, you're, if you have a corporate environmental health and safety group that comes and audits your facility, um, if they're looking at lockout, tagout, and it applies to you, they're going to say, let me see your energy control program. That's your written program for energy control. And when I'm looking through there, I'm seeing your procedures, how your employees are trained, uh, your, your lockout, tagout procedures, and the issuance of locks and tags. Uh, a lot of that would be in your program, and also periodic inspections. And we're going to be talking about um, all of those in just a few minutes. OK, we got a question. Can we simply put things out of service rather than lock out, tag out? Oh, that's a great question. I love that question. Okay. When you take a piece of, let's say, uh, you go to a company and they have fork trucks and they have to do pre-use inspection of these fork trucks. And they do a pre-use inspection, they find something does not pass. They're taking that fork truck out of service. What what type of tag typically would a company put on that fork truck? I'm not saying for the person working on it. I'm just saying to take it. Okay, Robert, 
correct, red. Now your red out of service tags, that's not a lockout tagout tag. That's not part of your lockout tagout program. What that red tag does uh, it's a tag that says do not use this piece of equipment under penalty from your company and it's typically signed that says do not use this equipment. So it could be a bench grinder, it could be lots of equipment not working, dangerous, um, or you may take something out of, out, of, out of use forever. You know what, this equipment's bad, we're taking it out of service, never going to use it again. Now, let's get, let's get back to the question. Now, just taking it out of service and you start working on it, then service and repair, that's lockout, tagout. Then we're getting into a whole different boat. So uh, you're going to have to follow lockout, tagout procedures and tagging and all that. So. Uh, just having a red tag on there, I would not be working on uh, out of service equipment like that. Um, that's used, typically used to keep people from uh, using something immediately or forever. It's like when we do ladder safety, if a ladder has to be taken out of service, a company will red tag that ladder and uh, so somebody won't grab it and use it. And if that ladder is thrown away, what's the proper way to throw the ladder away? Proper way. See what you got to say about that. Destroy the ladder, cut it in half, right. So, um, William, I see you don't have any sound, and you, so you can't hear me saying that. Uh, Check. You, I'll put your sound. Type this. If I can type. Uh, sound issue is on your end. Okay. Now, uh, again, any equipment you throw out, it could be electrical, it could be a ladder or anything, make it, like Joel says, make it unusable. Because you can face liability, and it may not necessarily be OSHA liability, but if somebody takes a broken ladder home and they fall to their death or it collapses on them and has your company name on it, uh, lawyers, a lot of lawyers would go after that, and you would have, um, you might have a pretty serious case there. Now, right now we're talking, we're going to talk about tag out systems. And this is just a tag. There's no lock with it. Is there ever, uh, y'all ever in your organization have a situation where you have to tag out only and can't lock it out to do service and maintenance? And some of you are not going to have that issue. Any of y'all have tag out only anywhere? Okay, I don't know is a great answer. So I don't know means probably you don't. There can be. We want this to be rare because a tag alone doesn't do a whole lot to stop me from using a piece of equipment that somebody else is working on. Now I'm going to give you an example. Uh, when I was in pharmaceutical manufacturing, and we had a packaging line. Uh, we would fill bottles with tablets and they would go down the line and then uh, cotton would go in there and, a, and then a seal and then the cap and the cap bottle would go into a cartoner. And the cartoner would take folded cartons and would unfold them and, and shove the bottle in there and close it. And the, the, car, the cartoned product would keep going down the line. Well, the cartoner, the cartoner sometimes would not work right, or there was an issue where the cartoner needed to be repaired. Well, these cartoners, some of them are very sophisticated. A lot of moving parts, a lot of complex complexity to it. So, 
the maintenance person had to have a jog, a J-O-G, jog, a jog control. Now, um, okay, Ricky, you do have a Duke Power example too, okay? So the, uh, the people that were working on it, they had to have it energized to work on it. Certain op certain operations. So the jog control would plug into the equipment, kind of like a handheld control, and they could bump it, which would advance the, the equipment just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit, to advance it to be able to work on it. So in a jog control situation, they would have the uh, control uh, tagged out, the main control, and they would be, used, be using a jog control and they would be following essentially a JSA, a safe work procedure for doing that. But tag out only is rare. I do not recommend tags only, but there are certain operations where you need to use a tag only. And you should have an equivalent level of safety for a tag. Now, I've told people in my classes before that the worst thing I've, one of the worst things I've ever seen in my career is I saw a light switch on the wall with a post-it note on it that says, do not turn on. That's, that's, bad. that's a bad day for a safety manager when they're walking around and they see a post-it note on the light switch, do not turn on. Well, they're, they're trying to kind of use it as a tag. Well, it's not a tag. And it's not the proper place to control that energy anyway. Because uh, the post-it note can fall off. It's not durable. It's not proper for, for that task. There are multiple switches. I could say do not turn on and I have another switch somewhere else that will turn it on. If you, now can you ever are there devices that allow you to lock out a light switch? Can you buy those? Yes, that's correct. So you better you better know if you've got that particular type of switch locked out, and it's a special device that screws in and locks on that switch where it can't be flipped, and, and you've got a lockout lock, and typically with a tag with that, then you better assure that there's no hazard for the person working on the equipment. Now, if you have fluorescent lights uh, in the ceiling uh, and you have the switch off, is there any other live energy up there? Yes. So uh, anyway, make sure people are smart enough not to try to take those kind of shortcuts. Okay. Let's keep moving. Um, procedures. Okay, we got a question. What lights have dimmer switches hard to lock out unless you lock out at the breaker? Carol, that's where I'm going. I'm going to the breaker. That would be the proper place to go. Uh, and you can lock the breaker out. Uh, no, it's not required yearly. Now, that's the best practice. If a company uh, trains people yearly on lockout, tagout, that's fine. But this is uh, only required when things change, like new equipment, new procedures. Um, yeah, Carol, you answered your own question. So um, anyway, uh, that's the best practice. So... Um, but I wouldn't go too long without training people again because people get really fuzzy on things. Uh, it's kind of like hazard communication is not an annual training requirement either. Uh, if you go too long on some of these subjects, uh, people won't, sometimes people don't remember anything even after a year. So use good judgment on that. Now, this right here, I'm going to say, is the most important part of my presentation today for everybody. Procedures. This, this talks about equipment specific procedures for the control of hazardous energy. 
you shall have procedures and shall have all the methods and techniques to control that energy. What the procedure is used for, how do you shut down and isolate all the energy sources, how do you place and remove devices, uh, how do you how do you test to make sure it's de-energized? Now, here's where the confusion is. You have a lot of equipment and systems out there that you lock out, tag out. If you're with a company of any size or organization of any size, you have a lot of stuff out there that has to be locked and tagged. Now, um, the, the thing is, you don't have to have a separate procedure for every single thing you've got out there. Now, I've got a slide coming up in a few seconds that says, if it's single energy, like electrical only, and a simple lockout tag out will make it safe for the worker, you can use a standard, essentially a generic lockout tag out procedure. And that procedure are the steps that are outlined in this presentation. So if you say in your program, single energy, simple equipment, where it can be controlled by a simple lockout of electrical, um, we follow these basic steps that everybody's trained on. Now, the times that you need a separate equipment specific procedure is when you have more than one energy source. And then all of a sudden you're getting complex. So if you're going beyond single energy, let's say the equipment uses electrical and natural gas, or electrical and pneumatic, or electrical and, you know, all those things on the list, if it gets complicated, uh, you better have a procedure. If you got somebody working from memory on that stuff, that's the danger zone. Now, uh, I'll give you a great example. A boiler. Now, some of you may have boilers in your um, facility. I know in our pharmaceutical plant, one of the ones I worked in, we had two boilers. And uh, when, we, when one of them was shut down, it was pretty complex. There were quite a few lockouts that had to be done. It was a group lockout. Well, you better believe that that needed a procedure. So uh, some of those lockout procedures for the major equipment like that, they're complex. They have pictures. Some of them even have pictures of the, of the lockout points. They have pictures. Some of them even have pictures of the, of the lockout points. And again, they're very complex. So anyway. You're going to need special procedures for multi-energy source equipment. And you're going to use your basic generic lockout procedure for everything else that's in your program. And Ricky, like you say, verify, verify to make sure it's de-energized. So this thing about procedures, make sure that you know what really needs its own special procedure. Now, here's the exception. If you shut it down, there's no stored energy. It has a single energy source. And when I lock it out, it's safe. And the equipment's isolated when, when it's locked out during service or maintenance. I don't need any special procedure. I'm going to use the, the generic step-by-step -step procedure that's in our program. Or you might have a JSA for it if you want to. But... Um, Anyway, it doesn't need its own procedure. Um, let's think, let me think of something. Um, you have a machine shop and you've got a drill press in there. Somebody works on that drill press. It only has electrical supply. Uh, I can use a simple lockout procedure for that. Uh, so again, that's just an example. Okay. Uh, now, again, on your procedure exception, uh, your lockout device is under the control of the authorized person. No hazards are created, and you've not had any accidents um, with that simple equipment. Um, P 
Pierre says, what about plasma cutters? Uh, Pierre, I don't know enough about plasma cutters to say. <laughs> um, again, take your piece of equipment. Is it one, more than one energy source? It needs a procedure. If uh, locking it out eliminates the hazard, then you should be fine. But again, uh, plasma cutters, again, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that at all. Now, sorry about that. <laughs> but use, uh, use what we just uh, covered to see if it meets all that criteria for simple lockout. And if that's the case, it doesn't need its own procedure. Now, here's a picture of hardware and um, chop saws. Again, is it one energy source? Yes. Uh, does uh, un unplugging it or whatever remove the hazard? Yes. So again, some of that equipment like that, a chop saw, I would think, unless there's something I don't know about chop saws, then I would think that would be just a standard standard procedure there. Okay. Now, um, I think um, I was trying to think. Uh, I was trying to remember if there was a bigger picture there. Uh, this picture, uh, if you go across the top there, I'm showing different items. Uh, I'm putting, taking this red dot. I've got it under one of those light, one of those toggle switch lockout devices. There's a lockout lock. There's a gate valve cover. There's a plug cover. If you if you feel like if you have plugs that aren't under a, a person's control, you want to lock that plug out here. Or if you want to lock all plugs out, I mean, if y'all are stricter than the standard, that's fine. Another lockout lock. Here's a device, like I said, kind of hard to tell unless you're holding it. This goes on a ball valve. Uh, this is for um, multi uh, people, when multi number of people up to six are working on a piece of equipment. You can put six locks on this. These two are for the lockout breakers, and these are three different tags, and this one has an employee's picture on it. So this uh, equipment is provided by the employer. Everybody knows it's for lockout tagout. It's the only device is used and not used for anything else. So the locks aren't used in the lock to uh, lockout toolboxes, and you know they're not used for general use. They're lockout locks. The hardware, again, needs to be durable and needs to withstand the elements in the area. Standardized. People look at it and say, oh, yeah, that's a lockout lock. So if my company had a lock like this and had an LOTO on it, I'm going, oh, that's a lockout tagout lock. It's substantial. In other words, if somebody came up to that lock and jerk, jerked on it, um, three, uh, uh, then it wouldn't come apart, and I'll get to your question here, Julie, in a second. Uh, and uh, it's also identifiable. Uh, if I see something that's locked out, either that lock device or and or the tag together, I can tell who is working on that equipment. Uh, three phase, uh, Julie. Three phase is talking about electrical power. Uh, uh, that's something I would just suggest you look up. Uh, that's electrical. I don't want to get too sidetracked here today, but that's talking about electrical. Um, that's another another subject altogether. So you might want to talk uh, to your electrician or somebody that's electricity expert, and they'll talk about three-phase power. Okay. Uh, yeah, I did have a bigger picture. Well, you've already seen this, and these are the devices. Now, is this lockout identifiable? What do you think? No. No, it's not. Okay, now this particular lockout lock, here's a case where you wouldn't necessarily need a tag with it if it was used properly. Because on the face of that lock is where you write your information in there. Who's this is a lockout lock. 
who's working on this piece of equipment. I would put that information on that little label that's on the front side. It's blank, like Ashley says. So the company has no idea who's working on the equipment because equipment may, you know, depending on location of this device, you might not be able to figure out who's working on this equipment. So that's blank. That is not identifiable. That is definitely a problem. Now, um, periodic inspection. Now, here's something that's cited a lot by compliance officers. They come into a facility and they go, uh, do you have a lockout, tagout program or an energy control program? And you go, yes. Uh, do you have um, multi-energy source equipment in this facility that needs uh, their own procedures? And you go, yes. Yeah, we got boilers and we got some other sophisticated stuff. Equipment out there is multi-energy. Uh, do you ever inspect those procedures? And they go, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Then we got an issue. Then that could be a citation. So with your organization and your facility, you know how many pieces of equipment or types of equipment that has multi-energy, that has its own procedure, that has to be inspected annually. The procedure, you have, you have somebody actually going through the procedure and somebody watching to make sure that it's working properly. So you have one authorized employee conducting the, the inspection and another authorized employee uh, doing it. And typically, you'd want to rotate it so you have somebody else that doesn't normally do it that's qualified, and you have another person watching, and you see if everything's working right and that there's not something you missed and the procedure doesn't need to be changed because equipment can be modified. Employer shall certify that um, periodic inspections have been employed, performed, I'm sorry. Uh, performed. So um, certify, that means that I've got to have some document to look at to show that an annual inspection was done on this piece of equipment, this boiler. And um, so certify, the word certify, what that means is signature. It's a signed document. It's like certified training. It's a signed training document, electronic signature or regular signature that the inspection's been performed. Now, um, you might go, oh my gosh, I have a facility. We got 50 pieces of 50 different types of equipment out there that has their own procedures, and I got to do this annually. Well, what you might want to do is have a schedule uh, so that you're not trying to do them all at one time. You just have a schedule like each month, you do a periodic inspection on each one. And because of the annual requirement, you make sure that not more than 365 days go by since the last inspection. But this is something that's cited a lot. Now, it, it could be a tag out inspection on that multi-energy, Equipment. I really can't think of a good example for uh, something that needs a procedure that would be a tag out annual inspection. So in most cases, it would be a lockout inspection. Okay, when you train your employees, uh, different types of training needs to be given to each group. Your people that apply the locks and tags they need to be able to recognize the energy sources that supply the equipment. They need to know what type of energy it is and how big it is, how many, how many volts, how much pressure, or whatever. And methods and means to, to control this equipment while I work on it. So uh, training, uh, you might go through a PowerPoint presentation kind of like what we're doing today, but real training, is actually doing the lockout. Uh, if I'm with a good company, uh, I like to do hands-on, and uh, I've, you know, I've trained an authorized employee. I've had them perform a simple hands-on lockout for me. 
uh, they've been involved in a, a group lockout or a complex lockout that requires a procedure. So they've hands-on shown me and they can answer all those questions related to those bullets. Now, the affected employees, the people that run the equipment, uh, their training could be, you know, kind of like a PowerPoint presentation like this, but they're also going to need to know um, what equipment is locked and tagged out that they use. And is, is there anything special they need to know about the equipment that's worked on in their area? Um, so that's your affected. And your other people, like the people up front that walk through the plant sometimes, um, what, are, what are your procedures for controlling energy? Understand that. And don't, don't try to start up something that's been locked or tagged out because it could cause a serious injury like an amputation or electrocution, that sort of thing. So that's all three groups. Okay, Tyler has a question. If you have non-mandatory single injury procedures, do you need to inspect those? No. No. Uh, now, like I said, you can go beyond the standard. Tyler, it sounds like you might have a job safety analysis or something that drives the lockout on each thing. If you have those that don't require an annual inspection, uh, you do not need to inspect those. I'm just talking about the equipment that has this complex. Okay, but you do, uh, that's great. Now, um, in your training, you're reviewing the procedures and all. Okay. Yeah, Tyler, um, when the OSHA compliance officer comes in, they're looking at whether somebody's exposed to a hazard. Um, so the chance of somebody being exposed to hazard, if you have qualified people doing simple lockouts using a simple procedure, um, not going to be much exposure or in, actually shouldn't be any exposure there. If, I mean, how could I get a serious citation if there's no hazard? But if somebody's doing a boiler and they don't have procedures or they don't inspect the procedure every year, that could become very dangerous. You could have a fire explosion, whatever, if people didn't know what they were doing. Now, if you have, uh, if you have uh, tags only, we know that the tag's just a warning device. It doesn't keep anybody from uh, exercising or turning on something. But did you tell people if it's tag only, don't mess with it, don't remove it, don't turn it on. You got to understand what it means. The tag has to withstand the environmental conditions. Is it inside, outside? Um, false sense of security must be securely attached. If you have tag out only, then you have to have an equivalent level of safety to something being locked out. There's a special reason you're using that tag. And some of you don't even ever use tags only. And if you don't, that's great. Now, um, the last bullet there says must be securely attached. Now, um, the OSHA standards get into what, what's meant by securely attached. Um, what's, how is one of those tags typically attached? What do people usually use that's good? What's a good thing to use? Zip tie, Ashley, that's right. Now, are all zip ties good for tag out only? All zip ties? No. Why? I want to know why. Okay, maybe it could melt. I'm not sure. Now, most of them can be cut. Um, but it's not because they can be cut. Now, if a zip tie is put on properly and it's cinched down, if it's cinched down versus barely hanging on there, you want to crank that zip tie down so it has to be cut off. When you, I mean, when you need to remove it, you can cut it. But uh, a, a zip tie needs to take a 50-pound or greater pull, for, pull force. Uh, 
You can look this up later. 50 pound pull force. 50 pound pull force. Uh, if you go to the store and buy a bunch of zip ties, those little, those little tiny ones uh, won't take a 50 pound. So I can yank on that tag and probably break or catch it, like Ashley says. Something hangs up on it, breaks it, and pulls that tag off of there. 50 pound pull force. The 50 pound pull forces are bigger ones. And when you buy, when you go to a store and you buy professional zip ties, I don't know if it was an amateur zip tie, but the rated ones on the bag, if it's in a bag, the bag says what the pull force is rating on that zip tie. So don't use anything that can't. And if it's something else, if it's a cord, anything used to attach it should be able to take that pull force. It, now, um, Timothy says we need to use something else than a zip tie on solar parts because I've seen situations where they were cut maliciously. Solar parts. Is this a lock? Is this used for tag out for lock out tag out? Timothy, is this a lock? Is this a tag? Oh, okay. Wow. Well, uh, and these aren't employees that cut these, are they? These are other people, not employees that are doing it right. Okay. Yeah, that's tough. When you don't have control over the site and people come over and just cut off tags, it's bad. Now, I don't know what, I'm not quite sure what you can do to do that. You know, that's a complicated situation. Your employees are going to be trained not to cut off tags because they're going to be disciplined. Uh, security, like Dan says, uh, what kind of security you have? Is the site secure? I mean, if you don't have security, you just got to do your very best to attach it somehow where at least you're making it very hard for them to cut off. Subcontractors, looters, and thieves. Okay. Wow. That's a, that's a problem. And so you have service situations where you have to have lock, tag out tags on there that long. So, uh, again... Uh, that's something we don't really have time to solve right now <laughs> in this webinar, but wow, I, you got my sympathy there. A company can control that, um, but in your case, it's, it's really hard to control. Now, let's think really quick. What, um, what would not be used to attach a tag? Not be used, ever. I'm going to use the word ever. Tape, string, okay, paper clip, uh, rope, eh, pins, rubber band, glue, twist tie. Yeah, anything that, well, for the question number one, can it take a 50 pound pull force? Can it break easily? So that rules out a lot of this stuff. Rubber band, people do it all the time. It's easy to rubber band a tag onto something. But you're moving equipment through, it catches on the tag, it breaks, it breaks the tag off. Uh, tape. Those are all great answers. Now, here's the training. They do not need to be trained annually, even though you might. That's great if you do. You can train people as often as you want. But when people change job assignments, the equipment changes, procedures change, or when an inspection shows that people are not following procedure or not knowing what they're doing, then you're going to train folks. And I would do it on a basis that's frequent enough where people just don't forget what they need to do or forget the rules or whatever. Okay, is this a proper lockout? Uh, this should be this should be pretty well blowing your mind. Now this is a uh, I guess we call it a bandsaw. Uh, there's a blade, and you use that light to cut wood in a shop. 
I think I did work in the shop. Now this uh, this is a place where that has employees, and um, this is not staged. Um, this is not staged. So I've got that picture blown up there on the right. So I've got the blade that cuts the wood. I've got a no, I've got. They've got they've got a hasp on there. They've got a tag that's not filled out on the blade on the point of operation. And this was not this is not staged. Uh, no, uh, the tag the tag's being held by the hasp. Uh, in a lockout situation, that hasp is closed, and you put locks through those holes. So if you're not familiar with those hasp, um, you, can, you can look at some later. But now, what bothers me is this is a, pl a place where people work that has employees, and this picture was not staged for safety training. So somebody has not got a clue here about lockout tagout and might be dangerous to work with. Now, if I turn on that saw, is there a hazard now? If I switch that saw on like that, yes, it's terrible, terrible. On like that, yes, it's terrible, terrible. So you're going to go to the power source for that saw, and you're going to properly lock it out. You do not lock out the point of operation. This isn't even locked out. There's no lock. A cast being used improperly, and tags not filled out. Um, I I just would I would want to just say, does this place have a safety program at all, and does anybody have a clue? So there, uh, that's pretty terrible. Now, the authorized employees are going to lock out the equipment. Common sense. Here's a lock, lockout lock and a tag. And um, when, they, when they lock out something, they're going to tell the people before they do it, hey, we're getting ready to work on your equipment. Don't mess with our devices. This is when we're going to do it, and this is when we're going to finish. Now, here's your, here's your basic steps for lockout tag out so in your energy control program this is going to be like your standard procedure for a single energy pieces of equipment so that would be in there in your in your program you say simple equipment single energy that meets the exception for procedures this is what we do in a lockout tag out situation all other pieces of equipment use a Special procedure. Okay, so we're going to go through it really quick. We only have about 10 more minutes. Okay, we're going to prepare for shutdown. What kind of energy do we have? What are the hazards? How do we control it? So we're preparing. And then we go through the next step. We're turning the equipment off. And um, now... Uh, there is some equipment out there that if you don't turn it off, uh, if it's in the on position, let's say you have a power outage and the equipment's not turned off and the power comes back on, the equipment starts running again. Uh, those are some of the crazy things you have to think about. Uh, but anyway, turn your equipment off. We're going to isolate it. We're going to go to where we need to, to, to isolate the energy for the equipment. So I'm going to electrical panel here. I'm going to apply my lockout device, lockout tagout device, authorized employee. The, uh, if the locks uh, have enough information on them to make them identifiable, you don't have to have a separate tag with it. Some companies like to put tags with their locks every time to make them identifiable. So when I used to work in industry, we used locks with tags to gather. Okay. All right. Uh, then we're going to release stored energy. So electrical, that's your capacitors, 
or your pneumatic, your compressed air, any of that, you're going to release your stored energy. And then the biggest step, one of the biggest steps of all, is you're going to make sure that you don't have any energy. I mean, there have been cases where people would lock out the wrong breaker, the wrong box. They would make a mistake. They'd be in a hurry. And they locked out the uh, energy for the equipment right beside the one they're working on. So you're going to verify. And uh, when you're through doing your work, you're going to inspect the work area, look at your employees, and remove. Okay? Um, so all your items have been removed, so when the equipment starts back up, you don't have, like, uh, screwdrivers and hammers and stuff being hit by belts or thrown by the equipment. You know, you want all the other stuff removed that could cause a hazard. Uh, you're going to find out where everybody is. You don't want anybody in the area where you're going to uh, re-energize. And then you're going to properly, this is what this slide says here. And then we're going to remove the lockout device. And it's going to be removed by the person that does the work. They're going to be in control of their own key. They're not going to give their lockout key to anybody else. So they're in control of their own key safety. Now the exception on this slide says when the authorized employee is not available it could be removed under the direction of the employee, the employer. That's called an emergency removal. And we're going to talk about here in just a second. Okay Carol, another reason to verify in case equipment was wired incorrectly during construction you think it shut off but still energized. Okay that's a good comment. All right. Now, in your program, you're going to talk about emergency removal of somebody's lockout lock. Let's say somebody's working on equipment, and the horn sounds for the end of the shift or the day, and they go on vacation, and they go to California. And uh, that equipment still hadn't been fixed totally. You need to put another mechanic on there. They put, they put their lock on there. And but you've got to remove that other person's lock. Well, you better verify that person's not around. You've made all efforts to to contact them, and then when they ever come back, you're going to let them know what you've done. So what you've done is uh, you've taken this is proceduralized and should be documented. You've taken bolt cutters or you cut that their lock off, or you have a controlled secondary key that's in a control box by the safety manager who had all the second keys to, for emergency removal. So you have a program where you have all the secondary keys in a, a control box only be used in an emergency or you, you've destroyed all number two keys and you cut the lock off. Um, now when you're when you're testing or positioning machines you're going to clear the area, remove employees, remove the device, energize, test, de energize, and apply, reapply controls. If you use contractors, uh, you better get on the same page of music with your lockout tagout program because they're on your site and they have to comply with safety rules and you have to be clear on what they're doing. If they're not qualified in lockout tagout, it's like, why are you, why are you even using them? And uh, do they need to be trained on your procedures? It depends. Is it a construction site? Is it your site? What equipment are they working on? It can get complicated. Now, group lockout, I'm, going, I'm covering a lot of stuff fast because we're running out of time because I've got like four minutes. Group lockout tagout. Here's a situation where you say you have two mechanics working on a boiler that's shut down. And the boiler has 15 lockout points. Uh, you have a procedure to uh, assign 15 lockout locks to the equipment to lock everything out. All those keys go into a control box, and your two mechanics put their lockout locks on that box that has all the keys for all the lockout points on the boiler. You have a supervisor under uh, this controlling all that, so it's a safe procedure. 
But here's a case where one lock and one key is not good enough for the mechanic. So that's called group lockout tagout. Uh, you can go to YouTube. There's some good videos on people performing group lockout. That's something you would kind of like to see um, instead of just see it on a PowerPoint slide. Just watch, just see somebody actually doing it. Okay, that I've covered that. Primary responsibility. Coordinator can use more than one crew. Okay. Shift changes. Uh, somebody's working on something. They got their lock and tag on. Second shift person comes on. They put their lock and tag on. And first shift guy takes his off. Proper procedure. Uh, the the, the uh, OSHA standard has a sample program in there. Appendix A if you need to look at it. We also have sample written programs on our website if you don't have one. It's like a template. So, wow, we've taken like an hour and 27 minutes. Uh, any last questions? It's a lot. If you've never been trained on lockout, tagout, uh, you might need some more information than what I've covered today. Any other questions before we end this session? Okay, so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and call the end of this webinar. It's about 11.27 by my watch. Thank you very much. Uh, and my name and contact information is at the front of the chat. You can scroll all the way up to the front of the chat. and. Um, I'm Tom Wilder, Tom Wilder at labor.nc.gov, and 919-807-2898, contact information. All right, you've been great today. Oh, we had a gigantic class, had some great questions. If you have any other questions, you can call our... Uh, Call our office, main office number, 919-807-2875, and ask for a standards officer to ask, if you ask, want to ask questions, or email a question to ask.osh at labor.nc.gov. Okay. Thank you so much for being on training today. Uh, you've been great, and hopefully this was helpful to you. If you have any other questions later, you know where we are. Okay, you, again, you have a great day, and um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the webinar very, right now in just a minute. Thank you, John, Carl, everybody that's logging out, Melanie. Like I said, we had a pretty big class today, and like I said, hopefully this was useful to you. All right, so I'll go ahead and turn our wonderful music back on for just a minute. And then I'll log out shortly. Farmers and what's greater than karaoke? Night? What's great? Curb appeal. You know it when you see it. And with the Home Depot, today is the day for doing. Boost your curb appeal with the best brands at the best prices. From new garage doors to colorful flowers, exterior lights to a new coat of paint, yeah, inspiration so to installation. You can do it or let the Home and, Depot do uh, it for you. Visit homedepot.com slash services for All more right. information on installing your That's next it. project. The Home Depot. With the more safe. More do it. Right. U.S. only. See store for yeah. details. Happy Friday.